Good afternoon. I'd now like to call to order the January 10th meeting of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May we now have a um, roll call from staff, please? Please say here or present when I call your name. Chair Gorbach? Here. Vice Chair Allen? Here. Commissioner Fotheringham? Here. Commissioner Getz? Present. Commissioner Mortimer? Here. Commissioner Hagee? Here. Commissioner Maria? Here. Commissioner Posta? Here. And Commissioner Burt? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now is the time in our meeting for public comments. And as I have no public comment cards, we'll go on to agency reports. I'd like to call on Commissioner Posta. Uh, yes, we have Julie Spivak here, the newly ordained uh, director of the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program, to give a report on upcoming events. Julie, take it away. Thank you, John. All right, so I'm going to focus on our 2018 Wellness Fest, and this year's Wellness Fest gathers 67 local businesses and public service agencies to support good health and wellness for the senior population in the Conejo Valley. Sponsors this year include Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center, Sunrise Senior Living, and Home Helpers and Direct Link. This event brings a wide variety of information and resources. Screenings include hearing, blood pressure, BMI, dental, and cardiovascular. Summit Health Group will be offering free chair massage. This is a free event, but those wishing to have a bagged lunch must get a ticket at the Global Center front desk. These are going to be supplied by Sunrise Senior Living, and we have about 70 tickets available. Still left over. We, had, we started with 300. Each year, the Wellness Fest features a unique theme, and we're doing uh, 2018 is going to be a Western theme complete with a photo op with John Wayne. The Stagecoach and Museum will also be there, featuring some of their Western collection, which will be on the, sta um, the main stage at the Global Center. Watch for ukulele entertainment, as well as some new features we have this year. We're gonna have a miniature therapy horses, a gigantic therapy rabbit, and comfort dogs. Guests can also tour the Gobel Center Garden, which will be hosted by our master gardeners, test out new virtual technology for seniors, and take a virtual dementia tour. There will also be a courtesy shuttle, thank you to Thousand Oaks Transit, from the library and back park to the Gobel Center. The festivities will be taking place at the Gobel Center on next Wednesday, January 17th, from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. And um, if you have any questions, please contact the CSVP office, and it is 805-381-2742. Thank you. Thanks, John. John. Work you're doing over there. <laughs> Lots Fun of great stuff. work, and I hope they all come to everything that's available. Thank you. Uh, Patty Ham, uh, since she's not here, she's a director of the Global Adult Community Center. I'll give her report. Uh, as you're probably aware, there's tons of programs at the Global Center, many tailored for senior citizens, and it would take all day to list them. You can find them all in the Global Gazette, which you can pick up at the Global. If you haven't been there, get there. It's really a beautiful place. And it's especially tailored for people like you and us. For us and you, you and us. We do have some special events and programs coming up this month, which should be of special interest to you. Is that home you bought when you were young and frisky? The same home you would buy today when you're no longer so, quote, young and frisky? Uh, okay. Consider making some changes that would make it more livable and especially safe for your current stage of life. We'll plan to come to the Global on Friday, January 19th from 2.30 to 4 o'clock for a seminar on hiring a contractor and estimating remodeling costs. You can't beat the cost, it's free. 
The seminar is for senior homeowners looking to do some remodeling, repairs, adaptive products to make your home more adaptable for concerned seniors. The speaker is Annette Borsma, MS. She will be facilitating this workshop with licensed contractors, Don Don McMaster and John Hill, who will be on hand to answer questions about costs and safety in hiring. You can make reservations at the front desk at Goble or by calling our number there, 805-381-2744. Anybody out there been burned by the ever-increasing financial scams, especially directed at seniors? If you've been paying attention to the reports given periodically by our resident director on expert on scams, Commissioner Ron Haggy here, you have been spared to make you even more aware and especially of the especially despicable scam of financial elder abuse. We are presenting a program addressing it on Thursday, January 25th, from 11 to 12 at the Global. No scam here. It's free. The State of California Department of Insurance will be offering a PowerPoint presentation with information on financial elder abuse. Become informed, educated, and aware of how to protect yourself from fraudulent activity used by insurance agents, brokers, when it comes to life insurance, annuities, investments, and even burial final expense coverage. The abuses in the sale of annuities and the characteristic traits of broker agents and other scam artists. Again, reservations can be made at the front desk at Goble or by calling the 805-381-2744 number. Talking about burns or being burned, there is another burn problem for seniors, physical burns. On Thursday, January 18th, from 11 to 12, we will have a seminar, seminar on burn prevention for seniors. Again, it's free. The Grossman Burn Foundation will cover why seniors have high burn risk, the degrees of burn, common burns, and their prevention, as well as burn first aid. As is the case with most events, reservations can be made at the front desk at the Gobo. Any sports enthusiasts out there that like to party? Silly question. Of course there are. Why not come to the fantastic Super Bowl party at the Goble on Super Bowl Sunday, February 4th? Tailgating begins at 2 o'clock. The game begins sometime after 3. You can purchase tickets at the Goble front desk for $10 per person beginning January 19th. You must purchase them prior to January 29th. If you don't like football, come for the original commercials and halftime show, which always is great. Thanks for listening. See you at the Global. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner Posta. I now would like to call on Vice Chair Allen for the other commissioner reports. Okay. Thank thank you, (coughs) Chair Gorbach. Uh, I'd like to call on Commissioner Maria for the Senior of the Year. Thank you. Um, One of the highlights of our year every year is the Senior of the Year Banquet that we hold the first week in June at the Goebel Center. And it's our opportunity to uh, to recognize and celebrate some of our top Caneo Valley volunteers. So the key to that is we like to get a lot of nominations. And I do want to make everybody aware that the nomination forms are available online. You can go to toaks.org and make sure you volunteer or you make recommendations to someone in an organization that may be doing the volunteering on your behalf. Um, Make sure you get those forms completed because we always like to have a big population to to choose from for this banquet. So again, the forms are available online for Senior of the Year nominations. Thank you, Commissioner Maria. Now I'd like to call on Commissioner Fotheringham. Hi. uh, A couple months ago, I introduced a 
a, a, a series of topics on family caregiving. Um, today, I'd like to uh, go over some of the skills and resources that are available in sort of a broad brush fashion, and then in the future, get into these in a little more depth. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good bet that almost all of us in the audience will have some involvement in family caregiving and so forth during our lives. Uh, many of you may already have that. Uh, unfortunately, caregivers don't don't get to choose the skills they need. Those uh, sort of evolve, and so it's hard to get sort of training in things uh, that you might need to do in advance and so forth. Um, and they seldom have the opportunity to l learn new skills except on the job. Um, so one of the, the most things that I think is the most important skill is just recognizing that you're not alone, that there are other people who... Uh, uh, are in the same boat and other people who may be available to uh, uh, to help you and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we hear all the time when we fly on airplanes is uh, put on your own oxygen mask first. This applies to a lot of other things that we do in life and particularly in the, the family caregiving mode. I came across a statistic recently that 40% uh, of uh, patients with Alzheimer's who are under the care of a family caregiver will outlive the person who's caring for them. Uh, and if you're caring for somebody with Alzheimer's, you certainly don't want to face that prospect that that uh, you're going to leave them uh, in need of care and so forth by uh, getting out. It's a, a very physically, spiritually, and emotionally demanding role. Uh, and so take it seriously and be aware uh, that you can get help, be willing to get help, and so forth. Some of the resources that we have, we have we're fortunate in um, the Canal Valley and so forth of having a number of uh, good resources. In particular, Senior Concerns provides some of these, uh, from training to uh, respite care and so forth, uh, including in-home respite care. So uh, get a hold of them, uh, learn a little bit about uh, what they have to offer and so forth, and they probably can help you a great deal. Um, there are other organizations. AARP has a, uh, a guide, a book you can uh, download and so forth to your computer that's a guide to caregiving and so forth. That is a great help. Alzheimer's Association is a great help. The, the Alzheimer's, yeah, the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, provides a lot of materials that are helpful to people who are caring for Alzheimer's patients. And one of the things that's uh, very helpful, and I th I'm surprised at how often people are reluctant to get involved in that, is a caregiver support group. Uh, you can find these all over the Canal Valley through your church, through senior concerns, often through a hospital discharge planner if the person you're caring for is uh, in the hospital. Uh, there's also a a law in California called the California Hospital and Family Caregiver Law. And the AARP actually has a, uh, a little wallet card you can download that gives you some information on what you uh, can expect or demand from hospitals. Hospitals are required to allow uh, patients in there to designate someone as their caregiver. And that person can be informed about the patient's condition and patient's discharge plans and so forth and can be involved in uh, any training for aftercare uh, uh, activities and so forth. One of the things that I uh, find most interesting and have been following this uh, for a few years are what I would call companion robots, or companion robotics and so forth. Uh, and there was an example of this that came to my attention recently called Care Coach. You know? uh, and this involves uh, a, an app on your iPad that you can download. It had the one example that, uh, that I was shown had a like a cartoon face of a dog. Uh, and the dog was uh, taught a lot about the person who's under care. Uh, you know, their favorite color, their favorite music, their birthday, and things like this. So it... Uh, it can become a companion, can interact, and so forth. Um, and I think probably like most of you, I said, well, gee, I can't imagine ever developing a very personal relationship with a cartoon dog. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, it uh, it can be effective. And those of you who uh, are using an Amazon Echo or something similar are already involved in uh, companion robotics because that's a, a somewhat primitive example of, the, uh, of that sort of robotics. These are 
robots that don't go prepare a meal for you, but say that they act in the role of a family pet that you don't have to feed or walk. So uh, more on this in future months. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Frothingham. Uh, now I'll uh, introduce uh, Commissioner Burt to talk about education. Um, hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, just a little bit. I'm the newest appointment to the Council on Aging, and uh, just quickly about my background. Uh, I've worked for the past six years as a volunteer in the ombudsman program, and I actually got involved through the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program uh, initially in 2011. And what ombudsmen do, they're state certified, they're federally mandated, they're advocates for seniors that live in long-term care facilities or, or other kinds of skilled nursing facilities and things like that. And one of the things that drew me to that particular program was the fact that approximately 60% of people who live in these long-term care facilities or, or who are disabled will not have anybody visit them outside of the staff, possibly a doctor or the clergy. So it kind of interested me that that might be something that would be helpful and that I could contribute. So that's something I've done, and I'll continue to do that as I fulfill my commitments here on the Council of Aging. Uh, what, they've, what I'm going to be talking about briefly is education, and I've brought a few slides of PowerPoints over there. And uh, what's available to uh, the seniors here in Thousand Oaks uh, there are three areas that I'm going to talk about. I know we touched on the global. I'll touch, I'll touch on that also at the end. But And I do have handouts if, if anybody wants them. But we have some incredible opportunities for education here in Thousand Oaks. I mean, you, if you've been to the Thousand Oaks Library or been to the Children's Library with grandchildren, you, you know what exactly what I'm talking about. We have two main branches. There's one, of course, on on. Jans, and then the Newberry Park branch is on Borchard. And that's uh, one of the slides that, that I have up there. Um, if, you've, if you've been to that particular, li to the library, you know that there are so many classes. Not only is it books, but it's CDs, it's DVDs. These are all free, as, as we always look for, for those kinds of things. Um, and actually, uh, if you missed any of the movies that are currently out or you watched the Golden Globes the other night and some of the shows that were on, uh, they actually do have movies at the Thousand Oaks branch and the Newberry Park branch that you can go to. Matinees at 1 o'clock in Thousand Oaks. Check the, the library. Uh, some of the particular uh, things that they've had, they've had The Big Sick, which is up for a lot of nominations. They have Glass Castle. Dunkirk, Victoria, and Abdul. These are all at 1 o'clock, and you can check with the library for the actual timing on those. If you prefer to go in the evening, they, the Newberry Park branch, actually at 7 o'clock on selected nights, you can actually see some, some other movies. They have Cowboys and Aliens, if you've heard of that. They have Arrival. Uh, what else? They have Mars Attacks several of the movies that actually at seven o'clock there. Uh, another thing about the Thousand Oaks Library and the branches is, and a lot of people don't take advantage of, is the virtual library. And the virtual library, if you access the website, and then on the bottom of the website, you'll see another particular uh, uh, referral to the virtual library. You can do this, of course, from an iPad, from an iPhone, from your computer. If you're looking for information, if you want to correspond with a professional, so say as an example, and I'll bring up, uh, that's part of the library. Those are part of the classes that are offered there. The next slide, this is actually taken from the virtual library research uh, of a number of topics. And if you look at that, you can actually see that everything's covered from arts and entertainment, language and learning, legal resources. Uh, you can actually, if you're looking for a job and you want to update your resume, you can go on the virtual library brain fuse and there you'll actually be able to correspond with a professional in the field submit your resume have them look at it and maybe help you tailor it towards a job that you're looking at or something that you want to accomplish 
and actually this is all free. It is a wonderful resource. All you do, all you need is your library card, City of Thousand Oaks. You don't have to be a resident of Thousand Oaks to get a library card. You have a 14-digit number on your card. You'll have to input your PIN, which is usually the last four of your phone number or something that you've selected that you remember. But actually, you're online with a professional in the field, free of charge. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource uh, and can be accessed from anywhere. You can access it from Starbucks. So, you know, go out and, and try, try, try it out. All right. A lot of people don't. They seem to have a little bit of a, a you know, a fear of doing it. But once you're there, it's terrific. The next thing I was going to talk about actually is uh, California Lutheran University. What a great place here in Thousand Oaks on Olson. If you've ever been there or walked their campus, you know how beautiful it is. They actually have over 4,000 students. They offer 36 majors, 41 minors. These are things that I, that I found out when, I, when I, I visited the campus. And one of the things that's really great about CLU is their affection for seniors within the community. If you're a senior within the Thousand Oaks community, you can actually audit any one of their classes. They have literally over 300 Offerings. This is this this booklet here. I was there, and they said, "Hey, why don't you just take this booklet?" I mean, these are all classes from accounting to art to dance to chemistry. Whatever you want to take, that's an undergraduate course. You can actually audit that course. What's nice about it is you don't have to take a test. <laughs> you don't have to submit an assignment, but you do have to show up because if and I was assured by by the uh, clerical people there that if you want to take a class and it is available the professor will, will allow you to take that particular class now what's involved in that is a little bit of work on your part just just a little bit on the board over there is this is that form that you'd need to fill out it's called the senior citizen audit form all you need to do, you can obtain a copy online, or you can, I'll, I'll have copies here if you'd like, but you fill it out, you bring it to the registrar's office at CLU, which is at 3259 Pioneer Avenue, right there on the campus, and uh, hand it out to the, their clerical. They will get the professor as long as there's room in the class. Some of these classes have 15 or 20 but as long as there's room there, you can actually take that class for free. And it's a great, great opportunity for all of us to increase the education, increase our, our, our breadth of knowledge. And, and I highly suggest that you, you look into that particular thing. Uh, I was surprised when I saw the number of offerings. I mean, it was, it was really mind-blowing. It's like going back to school for and not paying tuition. All right. The... Uh, and I, I did mention that, again, that, that not only is the library for free, the virtual library, CLU is for free, and of course, and it's been mentioned here, the Goebel Center. Uh, I also, just a little bit of an overlap, the Goebel Center obviously has been around. We're all familiar with it. We're all, you know, it's been around since 1975. It offers everything from breakfast to playing horseshoes to billiards to cards to all excursions across the world. Uh, a lot of the classes that are offered through Goebel are done by professionals in the field. There are fees sometimes involved. They're not, not big fees, but there are fees involved. So I, I highly encourage everyone here, again, if you haven't been to the Goebel recently, uh, they've got so much going on, and, and it is a beehive of activity and some place where just about everybody can be involved. Uh, so those are the three areas that I w wanted to talk about briefly, the, the library, CLU, and the GOBO. There are many other educational opportunities in the city of Thousand Oaks, and in ensuing meetings, I hope to be able to bring some of those to you. They're probably less well-known, but of course, hopefully, they're all going to be free of charge. That's our goal, and thanks very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now is the time in our agenda for commissioner comments. And let's start down at this end. Do we have any commissioner comments? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Hagee. 
Okay, I wasn't going to do anything on scams today. I want to leave time for our, our speaker, but I was at a meeting this morning, and uh, it was the obvious was mentioned. I, I, I'm embarrassed that I didn't think of it. But with the mudslides and the fires, we're being inundated with these, I call them vultures, that want to repair your home. You get them on the phone, they'll, they'll be emailing you, my dad is a contractor and he wants to help you fix your home back. Beware. Remember what I said all year long? Learn to hang up that phone. It'll save you a lot of money. But the way to check on these guys is to ask for their license number, if they're a licensed contractor, and then take that phone number, call Better Business Bureau. They'll tell you if there are about how many lawsuits are against this person, uh, how many uh, complaints have been turned in against them. They'll give you a whole rundown if, if it's a legitimate license, or they'll say, sorry, that license doesn't exist, and that'll tell you right there. So I just wanted to mention that briefly and so uh, to create an awareness. Okay, beware. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Heggie. Yes, Vice Chair Allen. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to think about our friends in Santa Barbara County, those that are missing, the baby that was found, the little girl, 14 years old, that was pulled out, the people that are families that are disrupted because they can't find the people yet. So just a, a thought for for those people. Okay, thank you very much. And at this end, um, do we have any commissioner comments? You know, another thing that um, we heard at the uh, three of us were at the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging this morning, and um, the Thomas Fire, as you know, largest in, in California history, but a lot of those homes up in the hills are old homes that were occupied by older adults. And um, a great many of them lost their homes, as well as, um, you know, a couple of the board and care homes. And so um, there's a program in Ventura County run by the Area Agency on Aging called Home Share. And the Home Share program at, was asked to help um, relocate, help people who have been displaced by the Thomas Fire to help find um, rooms in private homes. So if you know of anyone who is in that situation, it's the Area Agency on Aging, uh, vcaa.org, and they simply need to click on the link called Home Share to find out more about that. Okay. And now let's, um, let me introduce, please, Commissioner Mortimer, who is going to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Iqbal has been practicing medicine for over 25 years and has been on the staff at Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center since 1992. Following graduation from Rush Medical College, he completed a family medicine residency at UCLA where he was elected chief resident. Dr. Iqbal is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and the American Academy of Family Practice. He is also board certified in hospice and palliative medicine. He has a special interest in diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cardiac disease, and stress and mental health disorders, including dementia and Alzheimer's. Dr. Iqbal sees patients who cannot afford health care coverage at the Caneo Free Clinic in Thousand Oaks. He also provides medical services to seniors who find it hard to travel and live at assisted living facilities locally by visiting them at their facilities. Please welcome Dr. Iqbal. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, good to see some familiar faces. I'm nervous as hell. <laughs> Uh, respected council members and respected guests. Um, today I'm being asked to talk about a topic that is dear to my heart because I see so much suffering and so many families affected by it. Um, I think Megan's put a great slide presentation. Which way do I point? Okay, dementia. Dementia as a general term um, simply means that our cognitive function, our abilities to function, our activities of daily living, our thought processes, all of those are affected. And um, 
60 to 80 percent of the dementia we see uh, today is under the term of Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is just a specific type of dementia we're talking about. Other types of dementia are there, but predominantly we see more Alzheimer's in, in general. Um, as I said, a general term that is used for decline of mental ability. It's not a specific disease, it's just an overall term that we use to describe a wide range of symptoms, decline in memory, decline in uh, cognitive abilities, balancing your checkbook, simple things as um, some of the things I was hearing, you know, ability to hang up that phone when a scammer is calling, um, ability to make a good decision when they're offering something that's too good to be true. Those are the things that unfortunately affect, you know, are affected in the dementia. Um, types of dementia, as I said, there's many, but Alzheimer's we hear very commonly because 60 to 80 percent of uh, dementia is Alzheimer's. Interestingly, uh, the disease was um, coined by a psychiatrist, a German psychiatrist in 1901 who was observing a very young 51-year-old female in uh, the Frankfurt Asylum, uh, Mrs. August. And Mrs. August was only 51, but was behaving as though somebody, her brain was much older. So at that time, that used to be called pre-senile dementia. The term was that this person's not, you know, in that older age. So why is she acting as though she's, you know, having these dementia symptoms? So in 1906, when Mrs. August died, uh, he basically got the permission from the family to autopsy her brain. And that was the first time that these uh, uh, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, is the, which is the hallmark of the disease, was seen in the, in the brain of Mrs. August. And he presented his findings in 1907, and from then that term Alzheimer's disease has become the, the common nomenclature. Um, other dementias, we see vascular dementia as basically people who've had multiple strokes. A lot of the area of the brain has been killed by having you know, a lack of oxygen and blood supply to certain areas, eventually leads to cognitive decline. Uh, this dementia with Lewy bodies is a very specific one. Again, can only be diagnosed after death. You know, when we do autopsies of the brain, we see certain uh, little enclosures called Lewy bodies. Mixed dementia would be a mixture of, you know, a little of this and a little of that. Parkinson's is a very specific uh, uh, condition. Uh, you know, we, we, so most of us have seen people with Parkinson's disease, uh, shuffling gait, slow movement, pill rolling tremors at rest, and eventually their brain starts, uh, you know, declining. Frontotemporal dementia is a very specific type of dementia, usually diagnosed when we're looking for reasons why somebody is having dementia symptoms. And when we do an MRI, we specifically notice that the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe are disproportionately shrunk in relationship to the rest of the brain. That's what gives it that term. Um, Kreisfeld Jacob disease is a very, very specific, uh, you know, uh, uh, disease, genetic disease, and really very. Uh, um, in the old days, it used to be thought that it happens to people who eat other human beings, but uh, hopefully we don't have many of those in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Normal pressure hydrocephalus is uh, a strange one uh, where the patient behaves in a dementia fashion. And uh, when we go check their pressure in the brain, which is done by a cerebral sp by a spinal tap, they turn out to have absolutely normal. And But yet, when we start treating them with certain diuretics to shrink the pressure in the brain, they tend to start having, you know, they're able to walk again, they're able to control their bowel and bladder function again, and their cognitive function improves. Huntington's disease, we've heard about the term Huntington's chorea. They have this choreoformic or dance-like movements. And again, another neurodegenerative disorder where the brain basically starts going down. And uh, the wernicke korsakoff syndrome is usually associated with alcohol. So people who've damaged their brain with alcohol end up with that. Great storytellers, by the way. I mean, they'll tell you the best stories in the world. Yes. Can I take a picture of slide? Please, please. All right, let's see. So statistics, um, Alzheimer's disease, why do we care about this? Uh, several reasons. Uh, most of us, in my opinion, most of us in one way or the other through family, friends, loved ones will come across this. Uh, the more we know about it, hopefully the more we'll be equipped to deal with it. Uh, Cost-wise, I think 2017, the statistics are about $259 billion have, are going to go towards the care of Alzheimer's patients. And uh, the prediction is by 2050, when the number will increase, as I'll tell you in the next slide, um, 
something like $11 trillion of healthcare dollars will go towards taking care of these patients. So financially, um, uh, emotionally, all these, all these areas, this disease is a very bad disease. Um, sixth leading cause of death in the United States, by the way. So, um, and just a little trivia and something to alarm us and not to badmouth Los Robles Hospital, <laughs> but uh, first leading cause of death, heart disease. Second leading cause of death, cancers. Third leading cause of death is very interesting. It's called iatrogenic, which means system caused errors, which means hospitals and doctors kill you. So, so <laughs> symptoms of dementia. Um, short term memory problems initially starts out with that. Um, most of the time, very interestingly, the patient themselves absolutely, absolutely denying what's going on. It takes, a, it takes a lot of effort to get the patient to accept that something is wrong. Uh, most times, oh, no, I'm fine. Everything's okay. As long as I can do my this, I can do that. I'm perfectly okay. They, they're scared. They're fighting for independence. They're worried that if they admit that something is at fault, they'll, their independence will be snatched away. They'll be put into homes. They have these horrific images of, you know, living in closed facilities or losing their independence and having to live with their kids, which they don't want to do or be a burden on them. So a lot of emotional factors, a lot of, and then also the ability to process that. I mean, you know, you ask them the question are you having any difficulties just to process that and say yes I need help is very difficult for for an Alzheimer's patient um, they're progressive and get worse over time you know memory loss is the first thing we we notice uh, language uh, problems become the second thing immediately that shows up you know familiar words they'll be stuck on it uh, familiar terms that they have used many times won't come to them and they'll make a joke out of it oh see I'm getting old I can't uh, I get stuck in this I want to say this but I can't say this so very very classic um, then ability to focus and pay attention. You'll be having a chat with them about something else, and all of a sudden a different thought will emerge, and they'll start talking about completely without even batting an eyelid. They'll suddenly change the topic and go to something else. Um, reasoning and judgment definitely dramatically impaired as the pro disease progresses. Um, what's leaving the gas on, uh, you know, just handling um, electricity improperly, safety hazards, burning the house down, leaving the doors open and walking out, absolutely normal things or suddenly making a left turn thinking that thinking that I thought the light was uh, was green and I just turned in so a lot of accidents and things like that a uh, visual perception is another interesting one um, sometimes leading all the way up to hallucinations and illusions you know they'll be sure that they saw somebody standing there and you know you're bad if you didn't see it so um, Damage to brain cells. Um, like I said, the, the pathophysiology when we study what happens to the brain cells is that certain proteins uh, that are and communication channels that are in our nerve cells that, that help communicate from one cell to the other, they start getting disrupted. And little tangles called neurofibrillary tangles start coming into the brain cells. And the brain cells' ability to repair itself and and you know, be able to solve its problems, they start going down. So cells start dying slowly. Uh, a particular part of the brain called hippocampus, which is used very strongly in processing memory, short-term memory especially, is the first one that gets affected. And um, um, when we come to diagnosis, I'll tell you how we figure that out. Um, most changes are permanent, obviously, and worsen over time. Um, some Thinking and memory problems, that's why we always are looking for other secondary causes of temporary delirium or dementia that can be fixed, such as, you know, somebody's depressed, they'll behave like they have dementia. But if the depression's treated, they rebound back. Uh, medication side effects, numerous. I mean, polypharmacy is one of the biggest, biggest problems we face in senior care. Uh, the first thing I do usually when a new senior comes in, uh, and thanks to people like Judy Mercer who sent all her, all her senior <laughs> friends to me, <laughs> um, um, is I say, bring all your meds. You know, I, I don't want to just see a list on paper. Bring your meds in a, in, your, in a grocery bag and set them up on the counter here. And I start from there. And, uh, and uh, usually I'll, uh, de deprescribing is something that is now recently coming up in the medical literature, the word deprescribing that just like we prescribe, we should have the habit of deprescribing for seniors. And still a lot of physicians haven't swallowed that bitter pill, that you know, once we give them the pill, when is the right time to take away the pill? 
Um, and I've been a, 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 a you know proponent of that for the last 10 years. I keep educating my, my senior patients. Listen, you know, this was started for this reason long time ago. Has anybody ever considered or discussed stopping this now? Or the value of this for you now is really not as valuable. A simple example would be diabetes. Somebody is aggressively, aggressively being treated for diabetes, and we forget statistically that hypoglycemia or low sugar causes strokes and kills more people than hyperglycemia. But yet that senior will be on five different glucose medications and nobody's bothered to say, why are we so tightly controlling your sugar? Uh, natural other causes will kill you way before the diabetes will kill you. So what are you trying to treat right now? You know, it's more likely that in the, that you'll uh, you don't have anybody to cook for you. Somebody won't give you the dinner in the proper quantity, and you've downed four of these pills now. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you'll wake up to go to the bathroom, and your sugar will drop. You'll fall, hit your head, bleed, or go in with a stroke. So what did we accomplish by trying to be so aggressive at treating your diabetes? So really paying attention to some of those medication side effects would be important. Thyroid problems, hypothyroidism, low thyroid will definitely cause, uh, you know, similar symptoms to dementia and depression and things like that. Certain vitamin deficiencies, interestingly, with all the, uh, uh, you know, plethora of different diets that are out there, the veganism, the vegetarianism, you know, things swing like pendulums. They don't, they, you know, today it's good to eat uh, fat and meat. Tomorrow it's bad to eat fat and meat. You know, we just, we just don't know which way we are going or coming after a while. So B12 deficiencies, B6 deficiencies, zinc deficiencies deficiencies, magnesium, some of these deficiencies will mimic dementia symptoms. And obviously, excessive use of alcohol, as I said, uh, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is known for you know, presenting with dementia symptoms. Um, how do we diagnose uh, Alzheimer's and other types of dementias? Obviously, a careful medical history. You know, patient uh, is brought in by the family member, and they say mom's been, mis you know, uh, behaving oddly. Um, she, 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 you know, just didn't know what to do. She thought she had paid the bill, but then her, you know, things got disconnected. And, you know, that's when the, the children were brought into the picture. And all of a sudden, they go in and find piles of bills that have been, because I can't handle it, let me just, you know, put it away into a closet. Uh, hopefully, they'll go away. Um, and um, so things like that, you know, they'll come in with a problem, or we'll, we'll start seeing one of our patients suddenly becoming a little bit easily confused, and the usual uh, clear thought processes are, are changing. And then we'll start asking some pointed questions that are are you having difficulty with this? Are you having problems with this? And like I said, the biggest problem we face is denial. You know, they, they're scared to admit that something is wrong. It takes a lot of coaxing and, and you know, uh, encouraging them to be able to admit that something is off. Physical exam, obviously, um, you know, um, in the later stages of dementia, they'll be they'll be wearing bizarre clothes they'll be wearing the bras outside their blouses and stuff like that all sorts of strange things happen trust me um so obviously we can we can tell things are off the if their appearance is not you know they're not keeping themselves properly and they used to be very particular about how they looked you know all of a sudden think they've let things go some of those things really you know show up lab tests don't have a specific laboratory test for dementia but Obviously, it helps us rule out the other things I mentioned, you know, your thyroid problems and all those other things. So it's a quick way to kind of make sure that there's no other secondary cause of the dementia. There's nothing else that can be fixed easily. Um, recently, and we're lucky that Conejo Valley has uh, these diagnostic abilities, um, there's a very specific CAT scan that is that is helping us confirm the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Uh, it's a CT scan, and a, a radionuclear isotope is given called Amibeta, I think is the name of the of the test, and it's done by uh, Rolling Oaks and MDI locally. Um, I think I'm pretty sure hospital also has the ability to do that. So they inject you with a inject the patient with a little bit of a chemical that is characteristically binds to this amyloid and and uh, the the tau beta protein that is a hallmark of the disease. And so it lights up like a Christmas tree. When they do a CAT scan, they can see that clearly. So it's a confirmatory test. It basically says, yes, this is, this is your, your diagnosis is right. So first you've got to suspect it in the room, discussing it with the family, discussing it with the patient, and then you can confirm that. The other test that you know, we've been using for a long time is obviously a brain MRI. A brain MRI doesn't directly tell us that this is dementia, but it picks up all those other things I talked about. So uh, there's a normal uh, atrophying level to our brain as we get older. Uh, you know, globally, the entire cortex starts shrinking down. Um, but in 
typical characteristic uh, uh, dementias, certain areas will shrink down more than the other areas, like the frontal dem temporal dementia, as I mentioned, that you know the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe will shrink more than the rest of the brain. So there are different ways to kind of tell. Um, this last one, characteristic changes in thinking, day-to-day -day function, behavior associated with each type also tells us their movement disorder, somebody's Parkinson's versus somebody's Huntington's versus somebody's just got, you know, psychomotor retardation, different kind of symptoms show up. Um, risk factors. Um, obviously, getting older is <laughs> number one risk factor. Genetics, uh, there are four specific genes that have that have in the last 15 to 20 years with the, with the amount of study being done with the Alzheimer's that we've identified that these people are at a higher risk. It doesn't necessarily mean if you have those genes, you will get it, but it's a higher risk. Um, other risk factors, you know, cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure, uh, blood pressure especially not treated properly and ignored is definitely a, a risk factor. Blood pressure starting in the middle ages, you know, 30s, 40s, um, is definitely a risk factor. Diet, uh, they, have, they, have, they don't have any specifics, but they somehow feel like the Mediterranean type of diet, the, 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 the you know, low carbohydrate, uh, higher fat diet, those kind of things are actually a better option and, and help prevent um, dementia. Alzheimer's just specifically issues on Alzheimer's, what happens? Most common cause, as I said, uh, is, you know, is loss of intellectual function, 65 and older. It's an, it should not be considered a normal part of aging. I mean, I hear that from some family members. Oh, she's just getting old. And I'm like, no, getting old is different than people losing cognitive abilities and function. Let's see. Here's some of the statistics, um, you know, this this scares me, the 2050 part, you know, 16 million will have the disease. I mean, uh, right now, in my opinion, the medical system is not equipped to take care of these people. So I can imagine what's going to happen when they when they are triple the amount of, of numbers we have right now. Um, as I said, sixth, sixth leading cause, you know, uh, Alzheimer's by itself doesn't kill you. That's the interesting part. It's the other things associated with it that kill you. Um, the higher risk behavior, the falling down, the, uh, the you know, mixing the wrong things and, and eating them, um, taking the pills five times thinking I did not take it. You know, uh, um, there are some blessings to Alzheimer's. If we all had Alzheimer's here in this room, we'd forget about this rubbish talk after 15 minutes we leave from the room. <laughs> so there are certain things that are easy. <laughs> if you have something painful, you don't have to remember. It's gone. But, you know, it's sad. Um, so these are some statistics. Basically, they're expecting the cost to go crazy. And I, I have no idea how, you know, we keep talking about healthcare costs, but how we are capable of dealing with this. Um, warning signs, again, especially memory loss, number one, recent events. You know, uh, daughter calls the mom and, and mom says, oh, we haven't spoken for two weeks. And daughter goes, mom, we talked yesterday. No, we didn't speak for two weeks. You just keep saying that always. You know, you're taking advantage of my age. You, you are too busy in your life. You don't have time to call your mom. That's the usual conversation. Um, or something, you know, we had a lengthy discussion. We agreed we were going to do this. 30 minutes later, uh, what are we doing about this? You know, it's really sad. It's You see it in front of you and you go, I can't believe that. We just had this whole lengthy discussion and we came to this conclusion and yet absolute no recollection. Um, confusion about time and place. You know, they'll be, they'll be somewhere at some other time. You know, where are you? Oh, I'm in Virginia right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm living here. This is my address. Very, cr very correct address. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong. They're not making it up, but they're basically 30 years behind in their memory. My husband is about to come, uh, and, you know, he's been dead for 15 years. So those kind of things are very common. Um, Struggling to complete familiar actions. I mean, you know, uh, just uh, I see that sometimes the struggles in my waiting room and I'll send one of my staff members out, you know, just filling out a basic form, just name, address, you know, things like that. You know, they keep repeatedly coming back to the front desk saying, you know, what, what, what do you want me to put over here? You know, with things like that. Um, 
Again, like I said, language abilities, uh, poor judgment when making decisions, sudden changes in mood and personality. You know, people will bring their loved ones in and say, you know, he used to be so, you know, wanted to go out, wanted to meet with the kids, wanted to play with the grandkids, wanted to go to the movies, did this, just wants to be left alone, gets very irritable when we try to push him, gets very angry and starts, you know, really getting upset and angry. Um, forget about complex mental assignments when you get to the mild to moderate level of the disease simple act as balancing a checkbook isn't happening you know basic stuff of being able to pay the bills being able to do some basic day-to-day -day activities which we take for granted you know, not not going to happen um so the four a's amnesia aphasia apraxia agnosia so, again, the amnesia is for the memory part. Aphasia is difficulty finding words. Apraxia is difficulty feeling things around you. Agnosia is difficulty with familiar sensory inputs and things like that. Behavior, those, the cognitive changes. Behavioral changes, like I said, personality changes. Depression, obviously. Heck, I mean, you can't remember what you had for, for dinner last night. You get pretty depressed. Uh, hallucinations, delusions, you know, somebody's out to get me, somebody's calling me, somebody is trying to take advantage of me. And, you know, all the things that we had heard in our younger years that are, that are back in our memory uh, that, you know, talk about talking about scams for seniors, you know, all those things start, we start making stories out of that. And we start saying, you know, oh, they're definitely trying to get to me. And I know that there is the scam going on. The scam may be 20 years old, but they remember it as though it's happening today. Um, no cure, unfortunately. There's feverish amount of uh, research and work going on, but absolutely no cure for the disease. Even the, um, the medications we use that we have are more for symptom relief. You know, so we will treat the symptoms individually that are happening. Somebody's having difficulty with depression, we'll treat the depression. Somebody's having difficulty with anxiety and agitation, aggressive behavior, we'll use something for that. But as itself, there is absolutely no treatment. Two common drugs that, uh, that we've always heard about, Aricept and Namenda, they again work at helping repair and trying to you know, work with the neurotransmitter activity of the brain, but absolutely. Initially, we thought that they slowed the disease down, that they were, that if started very quickly and early in the disease, we were able to slow the progression of the disease. Re later research proves that there's no difference. In fact, one of the deep prescription drugs that we keep talking about now is Aricept, that people have been on Aricept for so long that they're saying that beyond a certain number of times, five to 10 years, there is really no benefit. So why add that another pill to their life? Nemenda, however, I keep, I keep hearing good things about it and I keep using it in my patients. I'll stop the Aricep, but I'll keep the Nemenda going because it does give them some ability to hold on to their cognitive function for a while. Uh, with the research on the genetic part and knowing uh, the genes we have available uh, that are responsible and certain uh, uh, typically working at the pathophysiology, the little chemical messengers in the brain, the proteins and things like that, there's a lot of pharmacologic research going on because it's such a big issue. It's really scary to, you know, to look at the future and see what to expect. And medications, as I said. Um, myths about Alzheimer's. Again, like I said, memory loss is not natural with aging. You know, small things, forgetting some things here and there, for perfectly fine. Uh, but you should not. Be, it should not be a, a routine thing. And it's sometimes very difficult even to convince the the family members. Uh, I had a patient who. Um, Initially, the wife brought him in and uh, said that, you know, he keeps walking into rooms and saying, what did I come in here for? And, um, and the husband is shaking her head in the back. You know? so I'm like, okay. And so there was, there was no way to convince him that something was wrong. Um, three months later, so I, I told him that, listen, if we start these medications early, we can, we can help, you know, help with the cognitive function and, and things like that. But he wouldn't have any of it. Three months later, he walks into the, into the waiting room and says he wants to see you, Dr. Iqbal. He's not on the schedule. I said, okay, fine, you know, just put him into a room. I walk in, and, um, and he said, Doc, give me those medicines you were talking about. I said, why? What happened? What changed your mind? He goes, I went to the Thousand Oaks Mall and went into the mall, came out, and then didn't know where my car was. <laughs> and I walked around for two and a half hours and just looking for my car. So obviously something's not right. <laughs> and so, so some events like that get them convinced that something is not right. And, uh, you know, happens to all of us, hopefully. <laughs> but um, the, the feeling that Alzheimer's disease is not fatal. 
Uh, that again is a myth. Alzheimer's disease does does kill, like I said, six six leading cause of death. You know, they die not be directly from Alzheimer's; they die from all the associated pathologies. Um, pneumonia happens to be a you know the top most killer. Aspiration pneumonia. They forget to swallow. They pocket their food. So uh, if a caregiver feeds them, they'll keep the food pocketed in their mouth. The caregiver walks away, and they'll go lie down and. It'll just go into their, you know, they'll aspirate, it'll go into their lung. So very common thing. So we, we keep educating caregivers and trying to teach them, hey, listen, have them playfully so, humorously so, have them show you their mouth, open their mouth, you know, you know make a concerted effort to make sure that they're not pocketing and leaving food in, the, in their mouth. Um, only older people can develop Alzheimer's disease. It is true that the incidence is higher with age, but remember the disease was actually called pre-senile dementia when it started. So it used to be something happening in younger people, 50s. I have several patients who are in their 50s that have Alzheimer's. Really sad, you know. And uh, uh, the, because the sadness is that they will live longer with the disease and they will face the, you know, they'll go on to progressively see the moderate, the, se the, the severe aspect of the disease because their physical health is so good that other things won't kill them. So the younger they get, the longer they suffer. Um, yeah, and uh, there used to be these theories, aluminum products and, you know, um, being in front of uh, microwaves and aspartame, which is in, in uh, low, sweet and low and artificial sweeteners, uh, flu shots, uh, dental fillings. They're all myths. There's no, there's no truth to any of that. Uh, we do not have treatments available. That's another myth that's out there. Um, so what do we do? I mean, you know, it's, it's unfortunately a, the cost of aging, the cost of living longer. Fifty years ago, our lifespan ended at 50, 55. Now our lifespan is women live, at least in the United States, live up to average lifespan is 83 and men live to 79. So, yes, it's the cost of living. If we live, brain is going to decline. Something is going to happen. So what can we do? The one absolute thing that has been proven is that those people who really consistently exercise are the lowest risk of Alzheimer's or any other type of dementia. And it makes sense. I mean, you know, the more the, more the healthier the body is, the, the better the oxygenation, the better the, uh, the, the inflammatory markers in the, in the body that are being linked, uh, uh, the better lower stress, uh, your, your body's uh, abilities to heal are kept better. Um, eat right, very important. And definitely I'm a very, very big fan of uh, promoting no crazy diets. I mean, they make no sense. You know, I have patients who are, who will be 60 years old and they'll come in and say, I got to lose these 10 pounds. And I'm looking at them and saying, from where? And, and, but their attitude is I'm doing this cabbage soup diet for 21 days. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, do you have that much cabbage available for 21 days? And crazy stuff. You know, I try my best to talk them out of it and say, say, listen, at this point, it's important to be, you know, good at in the, the mind, at the spirit, at, you know, at your emotional level, rather than worrying about, you know, some unforeseen fat that you're seeing somewhere. Um, Take care of your body, obviously, you know, make sure you're getting checkups, make sure you're, uh, you're, you're getting proper rest. Sleep is a very big factor. And we do know that as we get older, our sleep, our sleep becomes difficult. It becomes fragmented, it becomes broken. You sleep for four or five hours and then you can't sleep. We do know that certain brain, me certain medications that are used for, for uh, sleep, which are not safe. I mean, Ambien, for example, Zolpidem, which is a very commonly used and it was really promoted and everybody was, you know, taking it as though it was candy, and uh, and then later on, now in fact, Medicare will refuse to pay for all time for Ambien. Medicare says we've got clear data that shows that this this actually you know enhances dementia. So why are we giving this to our patients? Um, take time to relax. I mean, some of the Eastern philosophies of meditation, breathing exercises, taking 15, 20 minutes of, of time for yourself, listening to some soothing music, really isolating yourself, peace, quiet, serenity. We are lucky that we live in such a beautiful part of the world. We need to take advantage of that. No, nothing else. Take a cup of tea or something. Go sit down at Point Zuma and just watch the sunset. It's very serene for the brain. It's necessary. Sometimes we need to break away from our monotony. Sometimes we need to not fill our day with, uh, you know, back-to-back -back things and have to do so many things in one day. Sometimes spread them out. That, I feel, is what you earn if you get older. You know, idiots like me have 15 things to do in an hour, and I try to cram them. But I'm hoping that as I get older, I'll be able to say, 
no, I'm only going to do one today. You know. <laughs> Hope that day comes. <laughs> um, Definitely, we, you know, initially it was really promoted that doing things like mathematical, you know, things, Sudoku, things like that are, are really, uh, they really prevent Alzheimer's. Not true, but definitely gives the brain uh, a little stimulation, uh, you know, reading, uh, keeping, keeping up with your linguistic abilities, um, you know, doing puzzles, things like that, all excellent things to keep stimulating the brain. And learn something new. I mean, you know, when the brain is busy, when the brain feels that there is a purpose, it's harder for the brain to start going into this la-la land and, and starting to d disintegrate. So pick up a new language. Pick up, you know, start learning about a new culture. Uh, travel, uh, you know, go, go do something exciting. You know, as, as long as our physical abilities uh, are, are there, let's take advantage of that. Um, they did a very interesting study and, and in which they proved that, you know, sometimes assisted living facilities and these board and care homes and, and nursing homes can be really depressing places if you if you are you know if you go into into one they did a very interesting study in which they there was a memory care place where people were just zombies they would just not interact with anybody their verbal abilities were gone they would just sit and stare into space and things like that and so a young doctor you know who wanted some excitement in his life, decided to um, bring in a, a radical change. He fought with the city, um, he fought with the state regulations and everything and got approval for bringing in pets and plants into the, into the facility, which were a no-no. So they brought in 100 parakeets and they brought in like 15 dogs, 15 cats, and they brought in plants. And without saying anything to the residents, because they were obviously at different stages of dementia, they started going into each room, putting a, a parakeet in a cage and uh, putting a plant in their room. And quietly, the caregivers would just come in and take care of the parakeet and would take care of the plant initially. After about a few days, the dementia person started really looking intently at what the caregiver was doing when they would come in to feed the parakeet. And slowly, somebody who had never spoken started saying, no, he doesn't like to be touched that way. <laughs> all, of, all of a sudden, this person has not spoken for a long time, wouldn't talk, wouldn't answer, or anything like that. But they were so intent in observing the parakeet and their behavior that they were able to tell the caregiver. And slowly, they shifted the responsibility to the patients. They said, this is your parakeet, Joe. Take care of him now. And Joe, all of a sudden, developed a new interest in life started taking care of the parakeet. This plant is yours now, Joe. Make sure you water it, otherwise it's going to die. So it came to prove that, you know, if a purpose was there in our life, if we had something to do, if we were responsible for somebody else, uh, you know, we suddenly blossom up, you know. I, I counsel this to all my senior patients. I tell all of them, listen, please don't just sit there and, and fret about what your children are doing and how they're not calling you or, you're, or nobody's talking to you or you don't have friends. You got to go out there and give. You know, volunteer, get involved in things that you care about. You know, I give them different addresses and say, you know, call this people, call that person. You know, go to Kaneo Free Clinic. They're always looking for help. Go to, you know, uh, go to different, uh, go to the local Salvation Army Center and see if you can, if you can help them out. You know, the, the more we have a purpose in our life, the more the brain is stimulated and involved and active, the longer we'll, we'll hopefully be functional and worth something. Um, open to you guys. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Iqbal. I just wanted a quick saying, I'm one of those people that occasionally will walk into a room and forget, why am I going here? I have to back up and kind of replay what I was thinking of. So I was always worried, oh no, I'm starting to get <laughs> Alzheimer's or something. No, by that alone, it's not all members. <laughs> <That's so laughs> you wouldn't be sitting hear. on that seat and functioning. <laughs> they'd, right. all, they'd all pick on you after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that was yes, very sir. interesting. Yeah. Just a quick question. Now, where does the uh, glass of red wine fit in? <laughs> <laughs> That, that, that study was uh, sponsored by the winemakers associations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yes, Please, go uh, ahead. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, the pace of research is feverish, um, <laughs> and do you think it's uh, feverish enough or directed at the right areas? Would you like to see it uh, 
take a different course? Uh, no, I think good people are involved, good centers are involved in the research, and the hope is that at least in our lifetime, in the next 20 to 25 years, that we will see something, if not cure for the disease, at least some way to, uh, to delay the progress. I mean, we pick people up at mild, mild level. Mild level, you can function pretty well, you know, with mm-hmm. just a little bit of direction and a little bit of safety around you at mild Alzheimer's. You'll function pretty, pretty decently. So if we can at least even come to the point where once we recognize the disease, we can hold it there for longer that will probably be a blessing. Uh, so I'm hoping that you know it, it will show up with, with some results because there's so much technology now available uh, that we are, uh, there used to be this big problem that we could not penetrate the brain. There's a, there's a barrier, an unseen barrier called the blood-brain barrier. So even if I give you a drug, there are very few drugs that can penetrate through the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. So the only way to deliver drugs into the brain was through the cerebrospinal fluid where we would have to actually go into your, into your uh, CSF space like a lumbar puncture and deliver from there. Mm-hmm. Now we have technology to cross those barriers uh, in nanotechnology and different kind of things. So I'm hoping that we have enough raw material available that some good will come out of that in the next few, in a couple decades. Somebody else raised their hand. Yes, sir. Do we have any other? Go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, there's no cure or slowing. Reversing uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, you, you mentioned there's no cure or slowing of, of, the, of uh, or reversing of Alzheimer's. Does that ap- apply also to a dementia? The other aspects of dementia? Absolutely, because dementia by definition is a progressively worsening condition. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it a dementia. So think about it. Let's take another, the second most common cause of dementia is multi-infarct dementia. Somebody who has had small multiple strokes. There's no way you're going to make that tissue come alive again. That whatever part died, died. You lost function in that department. Even though we are blessed with a, a lot of different areas of the brain that are never used, that are recruited. When, when one, that's why you see a stroke patient you know, after a year of rehab being able to move that limb again. The reason is a different part of the brain has now taken over the function because that particular side died. So with that, we have some ability to help with physical problems and things like that. But when it comes to intellectual processing, cognitive processing, memory processing, there's very few areas. So you can't reverse that, but you can help uh, help the patient that's to come. I'm sorry, to cope with that? Is yes, that it? yes. So some yeah. physical abilities can be rehabbed. We can, we can bring some physical abilities back, you know, go from a, a wheel, wheelchair-bound stroke patient to a person being able to walk with a cane. That is doable with aggressive rehabilitation. Okay. Commissioner Gitt, please. There's a lot of work going on in DNA modification, especially for cancers. Is that also going on in Alzheimer's? Yes, yes, absolutely. They are working on the genetics because they've identified these four specific genes as as the as great markers of 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 uh, Alzheimer's, they're able to now figure out what can we do to repair these genes? What What is the fault at what level of chromosomal fault is, is going on in this person's DNA that leads to this? De- de- all of a sudden, this protein goes crazy and starts making tangles in the brain and starts blocking the microtubules and stops killing you know, the repair processes of the neurons. So de- definitely there's a lot of interest in that area going on. But no major areas of success yet? Not yet. Okay. Do we have any other... Questions from the dais? One other question. Do you Thank have you. a handout for this? Do you have a handout uh, perhaps for the uh, presentation? Uh, because I think that would be valuable. I, they can get it on TOTV, I guess, if you look at the archives and see the see the presentation. Yeah. I'm they'll, they'll arrange. They'll okay, good. make it available. Okay. And any other questions from the dais? Then I... I'd like to thank the doctor for a really, really interesting um, presentation. My pleasure. And we are going to thank you once again. Thanks. Thank you so much. You know, we have um, a full house here today, which is great to see. And those of you who are watching out in television land can join us for another really great presentation on Wednesday, February 7th, when we will have a physician here from Los Robles Hospital, a cardiologist, to talk to us about um, heart disease, AFib, and CPR. So um, just think about joining us Wednesday, February 7th, 1 o'clock in the um, at the Civic Arts Plaza. And with that, I would like to adjourn the meeting. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.